Oh, hang on a minute. What's happening? Oh, I lost you for a minute. Um, okay. So, uh, Danny Shaw, thank you very much for joining us um, uh, for a conversation about current events in Haiti, which are of great concern to uh, a huge number of people in the Americas and around the world. Um, and you have special knowledge about the situation there because you were there very recently um, visiting groups at grassroots. Um, I should uh, perhaps explain to our listeners that you're a professor at the, um, is it the New York uh, University? City, City University of New York, CUNY. Thank you, thank you. So, um, uh, and I, I hope that we'll be able to have a discussion just assuming that most people have a general knowledge of the recent contemporary history of Haiti, certainly since the end of the uh, Duvalier dictatorship in the 1980s. Um, uh, and all the history of uh, uh, US intervention, US and allied intervention, and also the disgraceful role of the United Nations uh, with their missions, their military missions occupying Haiti, and also their uh, uh, incompetent management of uh, recent elections over the last 10, 12 years in Haiti, or longer, 15 years. So the current situation uh, now is that there's uh, uh, an, another political uh, crisis caused by the absence of uh, any uh, legitimate government in Haiti. The response of um, the, the United Nations uh, uh, organizations like CARICOM and the governments of the United States has been to put forward what they call a transitional council. Um, could you talk to us a bit about the origin, origins of that and whether it has any support at all among the Haitian population? Sure thing, and uh, buenas noches, greetings, anti-imperialist greetings to Stephen and Tortilla Consul. Thanks for all of the amazing uh, solidarity work that you do in, in Central America and across the world. Yes, it, it is a dire uh, moment in Haiti, though the Haitians say this is not of our doing, this is not our crisis, we're the ones suffering from it, but the colonial overlords of yesteryear are again trying to dictate the Haitian people's uh, destiny. I returned from Port-au-Prince in Haiti uh, last month. I've been traveling to Haiti since 1998. Uh, I'm a student of the Haitian people in their uh, quest for a second Haitian revolution in the spirit of Jean-Jacques Dessalines and Toussaint and Cafois Lamont and Chamay Peralt and Jean-Bertrand Aristide and, 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 and Lavalas. And right now, the United States is trying to impose uh, this transitional uh, government, um, their prime minister de facto that they put into power a few days after the assassination of Jovenel Moïse on July 7, 2021, Ariel Henry, Ariel Henry uh, was never elected. He was not popular by any means. The Haitian people saw him as the latest core group imposition on the Haitian people. The only time the Haitian people have had democratic uh, elections was in 1990 and then again in 2000. Both times they elected uh, TTT, little, uh, that's that was his nickname, the liberation theology uh, priest, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, and both times he was then a victim or a survivor of coup d'etats that were organized from Washington, first under Clinton, then under Bush. This, this book is phenomenal, uh, Damning the Flood, Haiti and the Politics of Containment by Peter Hallward, takes you through the history of the Lavalas movement. The Lavalas movement is still there to this day. They talk about sali public, a public exit, a public opening, they what, what what the people are demanding is that there be representation from all the popular sectors and that they can have a participatory representative 
uh, uh, democracy. But right now, there's also what's called the Montana Accord. Uh, some of the leftist groups, some of the freedom fighting groups are in, are, are in the Montana Accord. Others are saying, no, that's the United States that's overseeing it. So certainly the political situation in, in, in Haiti, it takes some unraveling. I don't think there's just one tendency or, or one line. Um, but all these groups agree, and I think it is a, a moment uh, to defend unity among these different groups, that the main nemesis, the principal contradiction, is the United States uh, government, who is again trying to orchestrate what would be the fourth uh, invasion and occupation of Haiti in the past 100 years. Uh, the new methods that the U.S. is uh, using uh, definitely deserves analysis, because I think other countries that are under the gun from U.S. imperialism can draw certain uh, lessons. What the Biden administration has been trying to do now for three years or so is say that they will give the $333 million, that's the last figure that they gave, and they would then deputize 1,000 Kenyan police to lead this invasion of Port-au-Prince. Um, the Kenyan uh, parliament and Kenyan civic organizations have said no, they've, they've blocked it. So now the U.S. is trying to pivot uh, to Chad, to uh, Benin, to the Bahamas, to Guyana, to Jamaica, to the CARICOM nations to try to carry out this fourth uh, invasion. The U.S. itself doesn't think it can do it because it's uh, uh, $300 billion deep in this proxy war against Russia with the Ukrainian people trapped in the middle. Of course, the genocide in, in, in Gaza to the tune of how many billions of our taxpayer uh, uh, dollars so that's why it seems like the U.S. is trying to pivot in this direction at this point. OK, so perhaps we should explain to our listeners who don't know what the core group is, that it is, in fact, a, a foreign government and United Nations um, approved body imposed uh, with, with zero legitimacy from the Haitian uh, population. And they, for some reason, they seem to be the ones that are driving this a uh, so-called transitional council. And you make it sound as though there is some level of support for the transitional council. Is it in any way a viable um, uh, 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 mechanism for what for organizing what the uh, foreign governments say they want to do, which is they say they want to organize democratic elections in in Haiti? Is, is the transitional council in any way fit for that purpose? No, it's it's the Montana Accord where the left was divided, but the transitional council, um, it was something that was decided upon in Kingston, Jamaica. It, it was not something where the Haitian people were consulted. Uh, these were individuals who the U.S. and, and Blinken was there leading, you know, the, 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 the genocidal shuttle diplomacy from Gaza to the Palestine of the Caribbean, which is which is Haiti. Haiti. I mean, Gaza and Port-au-Prince actually have similar populations, so there's a lot of uh, similarities in terms of who has control of the water, who has control of the Internet and, and the food, who can get in, who can get out. So I, I think all of these um, analogies are, are, are apt. But this seven-person transitional council, no, no, th this was the U.S.'s will and in the CARICOM's uh, 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 will. Um, and Ariel Henry was still involved in it. So what we see is that U.S. imperialism can can impose the dictator. And just like Trujillo or Somoza and so many other examples, um, when it's not convenient to have that figurehead, they can get rid of him and then come with the next uh, demagogue and 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 try to change the principal uh, face when the underlying colonial power dynamics uh, have not changed. Honestly, the Haitian people, uh, in terms of their ability to mobilize since 2021, and that was the real effect of the assassination of Jovenel Moise. There was a movement of hundreds of thousands and of millions across Haiti against Jovenel Moise when he's assassinated. Ariel Henry and, and, and the U.S. overlords and Claude Joseph suddenly had carte blanche. And overnight, this massive liberation movement, which was in the streets every Sunday and, of course, across the diaspora, there was this uh, incredible hope 
Yon l'espoir, yon gros l'espoir. And that was really uh, 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 crushed. So many uh, Haitian analysts think that that was uh, done intentionally. There were 23 Colombian paramilitaries involved in the death of uh, president or dictator Jovenel Moise. There were uh, Haitian Americans with connections to the DEA, to the CIA, to Colombian and exiled Venezuelan private security firms. So that, that whole issue of the assassination has been incredibly well researched. There's a new book out there for Haiti watchers or anyone who's new to Haiti. It's called The Aid State by the journalist Jake uh, Johnson, who's at the Center of Economic and Policy Research. And what he does is he looks at roughly the past 14 years of Haitian history since the earthquake in January of 2010. And he looks at how the US, particularly the Clintons, Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, 2010, flies to Port-au-Prince and benights Michelle Martelly. Michelle Martelly was the first iteration of the PHTK dictatorship that translates as the Haitian bald-headed party. I don't know how any serious political party could call themselves the Haitian bald-headed party. So it's Michelle Martelly, then it's Jovenel Moise, and then it's Ariel Henry, and now it remains to be seen who's gonna be there next. And, and the Haitian people are saying, well, where is our vote? There haven't been any democratic elections since 2000. And there's this mysterious thing where the Haitians can never democratically elect the, the right person, the right por person according to Ottawa, Paris, and, and, and Washington, of course. And that's the core group. And shamefully, uh, Brazil has been a part of that, that core group. They've taken their seat at the table with the colonizing uh, uh, nations, even though Lula, of course, represents um, the masses of, of Brazil. So the Haitian people have been trying to get a letter to uh, Lula saying, you know, please stand with us and not with the oligarchs. Yeah, thanks, Danny. I'm going going back to this, um, the uh, Transitional Council. One, uh, one of the elements in it uh, are precisely the political allies of Juvenal Moïse, Ariel Henry, and, and also Michel Martelly. Um, and so... Uh, some people uh, regard the that PHTK movement as a kind of throwback to the Duvaliers. So it so that's that 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 seems to be one quite well defined block of political uh, uh, quite well defined political movement, a reactionary political movement. But there are also characters um, and individuals um, who have appeared. For example, Guy Philippe. And um, the, the 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 leaders of put the, this movement called Petit de Dessalines, and I understand that. G g correct me if I'm wrong. I, I understand that Guy Philippe and Petit de Dessalines have rejected um, the transitional uh, transitional council. And the, the the impression that you you give is that there's practically zero support or very little support for. Um, the right-wing clique um, around uh, Michel Martelly and Ariel Henry. Um, but what kind of support do people like Guy Philippe and Petit de Céline and or even Fanny Lavalas, who have, uh, it's been suggested that they might well take part in this uh, transitional council. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, let's go uh, one by one. Uh, Fanny Lavalas is really um, the popular movement of Haiti since the 1986 uprising against Duvalierism. It was a moment of incredible hope in 1986. Uh, again, the U.S. returns with the generals and the Raul Cedras and the Henri Namfis, these horrific um, uh, uh, sanguinary uh, uh, individuals who repress this Lavalas movement against all odds. This representative of liberation theology, Jean Bertrand Aristide, wins. Um, but then there's the coup against him within several months. Uh, he's 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 brought back, but his his message is diluted. And this whole time, the Lavalas movement is repressed, gunned down, uh, political prisoners 
I mean, Peter Howard, uh, this, this incredible author here, estimates that thousands and thousands of Lavalas activists and organizers. So it's not just um, Aristide who then, then receives another coup, suffers another coup in 2004. It's 7,500 Lavalas mayors and local politicians and federal politicians and departments is how they say states. Uh, Magistra, all of these individuals uh, are, are, are also uh, taken out of power, assassinated. So Lavalas is certainly still there. It has an incredible legacy. But I don't want to, for a second, over-glorify what's left of Lavalas. Uh, Jean-Bertrand Aristide has been forced out of politics since his exile in 2004, February 29th. Um, and Aristide now has his own university that graduates professionals. So he continues to make patriotic contributions in other unique ways because of the absolute repression. If they said that Aristide had nine lives when he won the presidency in 1991, today perhaps we could make the argument that Aristide has 1,804 lives. So Lavalas is there. But, and, and, and sometimes people get mad at me, but it's just the objective reality that I studied. And I don't pretend to be, have the only opinion or be correct on everything. I'm just giving an overview based on uh, uh, my years as a student of the, of, of the Haitian uh, liberation movement. So the segue into Guy Philippe. Uh, Guy Philippe is, um, he was uh, an, an army officer. A uh, police, uh, rather a police, uh, a police head, chief of police. He gets uh, expert military training from the State Department in Ecuador, along with some other soldiers uh, that the U.S. Uh, created this special unit. They were called Ecuadorianio because of their uh, expert CIA State Department training. So it's the Dominican bourgeoisie and oligarchs, the Dominican media, uh, along with the U.S. They have this all out hybrid war um, before the hybrid war on Venezuela and, and well, the war on Nicaragua has been going on for so long. But uh, in 2004, there's this whole war on Lavalas, on, on Aristide's presidency, and Guy Philippe is Washington's man, and it's the Dominican general's man. Uh, 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 the Dominicans give them uh, safe passage over the border. They can go in and, and attack and, and burn and kill and retreat over the border. And uh, Guy Philippe was the uh, central agent who carried out this coup. He got upset because he didn't get the positions and the power. He was a megalomaniac. So he starts to give interviews in 2007 and he drops all the beans about the CIA, about the Dominican generals. And they're like, oh, hell no, there's no way this guy's going to be a whistleblower. So the State Department goes in. I mean, how many violations of, of Haitian sovereignty? It's mind boggling. And they uh, take uh, Guy Philippe and they put him into a prison in Florida as an arms trafficker, as a drug trafficker. And of course, this is what money launderer. And of course, this is what he was with his expert CIA training, perhaps akin to a Manuel Noriega. Maybe that's the correct historical analogy. Uh, maybe not. 20 years later, miraculously, the end of November, take a wild guess who gets out of jail last year in Florida. Guy Philippe, within days, he's in Haiti. Um, at the end of January, I was able to visit his demonstrations. I was actually in his hometown of Pestel in Jeremy. I was able to, you know, do, do, do an overview of what he, uh, uh, represented. And he, he, he's against some of these other proposals because he wants to be the next prime minister, um, uh, uh president. It seems everyone wants to stab everyone, uh, in the back. And surely, you know, my conclusion now will shift in 24 hours, which brings us to Petit de Saline, to uh, Moise John Charles, a very popular mayor from uh, Milot in the uh, north around Ocap Haitien, the birthplace of the Haitian Revolution. He had a history of being a leftist. He was really in the streets with Petit Dessalines, the children of Dessalines in 2021. I mean, it, it was funny. At one moment, we were all just marching together, and there's uh, Moise John Charles. Uh, a lot of people, um, he has this curious thing that he does. He uh, his, his, 
his supporters often uh, hoist him up. So he's often on the shoulders of, of, of his supporters in the streets. So he appears uh, taller to give his speeches and stuff. He's definitely come from a leftist background. You know, objectively, there's been such extreme uh, suppression of, of, of the left in Haiti. I'm not sure. I couldn't say objectively what Petit Dessalines still has on the ground right now. Uh, to come into power in Haiti, you have to make a lot of deal with the devil, uh, with the U.S. embassy and with the oligarchs who do their their bidding. There was talk that Guy Philippe and Moïse Jean Charles were going to were going to fuse together. And then there was talk that Jimmy Cherizier barbecue was going to be a part of that. But sometimes there's just all these rumors and it is difficult to sort out exactly what's happening. But I can paint the broad anti-imperialist strokes so that uh, folks can can make sense of all of this. Yeah, there's a lot of um, reporting that leaves out all that kind of detail. So it's really important that you're you're able to fill us in. Even, um, although obviously, as you say, that's your opinion, but it's the opinion of a very knowledgeable observer. So we're very grateful to you for that. Um, one of the things that you mentioned earlier was that uh, prior to the execution or the assassination of uh, Jovenel Moïse, there was very widespread uh, uh, protest, uh, what might be described as a national uprising against his illegitimate rule, because uh, he, he, he wasn't legitimately elected either. So, and that seems to have been reflected, I've been reading uh, uh, some articles by a writer called Charlotte Chalmine, um, she wrote a series of three articles, Journey to the Heart of the Protests Against Ariel Henry, that have appeared in the Interna Internationalist 360 website, and I'm sure elsewhere, but I came across them at the Internationalist 360 website, which I recommend to anybody trying to keep up with events in Haiti or Palestine or anywhere in the majority world, really. It's an excellent website. But one of the things that Charlotte Charlemagne said was that... Uh, there's been extremely widespread uh, mass protests uh, over the last few weeks. I, I think the, the first date that she gives for these mass uprisings is January this year. Um, and she might be right or wrong about that, you can tell us. But And she talked about very widespread mass uprisings in places like um, in the, uh, how do you say the department, Arta, Arta Bonite? La Tibonite. Uh, Arti, uh, Artiboni. In uh, places like Saint Marc and Gonaïve. She also mentioned places like Capacien, Fort Liberté in the north, uh, Wanamant, which is right up there on the Dominican border, if I'm correct, Dominican Republic border. Yep. And also the Republic of, um, am I pronouncing this right? Anch. Um, inch. Yeah, inch. And also the that, that place you mentioned where, uh, uh, is it Guy Philippe has his base, uh, Jeremy. Yeah. And, and she, she talks about all these places um, experiencing very, very widespread uprisings and um, protesting um, about against Ariel Henry. Um, and that made, she makes it sound like a genuinely nationwide insurrection. Whereas the kind of false foreign reporting that uh, we, we generally come across suggests that um, there's nothing happening outside uh, uh, Port-au-Prince. And can you, can you tell us what your impression is of, and is there a genuine national uprising or are events mainly focused in Port-au-Prince? Yeah, uh, due to the colonial nature of how Haiti was underdeveloped, one nickname for Haiti is the Republic of Port-au-Prince because all economic and diplomatic and political activity flows from Port-au-Prince. So all of the uh, gasoline comes in through the ports of, uh, of, of, of Port-au-Prince and then it's distributed elsewhere gasoline right now in Haiti. When I was there, it was $13 per gallon. Um, there were often um, melees, just just people trying to get uh, gas, and then the police would show up, a private security office, and open fire. Hor horrific things. Um, Jeremy, I, I was in the protests in Jeremy that this uh, Chalmay, Charlotte Chalmay writes about. They were dominated by Guy Philippe, 
Um, it was all about Guy Philippe is the savior. And these were rallies where there was a lot of hunger. They were fueled by the moonshine, the clarin. Uh, they were violent. There were several shootouts, the oppressed killing the oppressed. One neighborhood turned against another. Guy Philippe uses this patriotic rhetoric. I mean, whether you're talking about a Jimmy Cherizier barbecue or Guy Philippe or even the now, um, you know, the former uh, de facto non-elected prime minister, Ariel Henry, it's not uncommon for a Haitian politician to opportunistically uh, use a type of anti-imperialist, anti-colonial, anti-U.S. discourse because Haitian people are not stupid. They know their history and they know they're a colony of the United States. They know they're owed billions in reparations from France, Canada, and, and, and the United States. So I don't think that I would agree with painting this, 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 this portrait of some united resistance uh, across Haiti prior to our, definitely that was the main demand. Ariel Henry was the fall guy for an entire, I don't say failed state, I say a successful neo-colonial uh, uh, state because any police officer who's still armed and, and any roads still functioning, it, they were all designed to facilitate the massive theft of resources, of, of capital, of exploitation uh, uh, across Haiti. So one would almost have to go city to city, department to department, province to province to get a sense of this resistance. Guy Philippe um, had, had uh, he, he's the number two in what's called the Besap. The Besap are these soldiers who were in charge of protecting the environment and they weren't being paid by the state. So they had a type of rebellion. And then there were rumors that Guy Philippe would march from the north, from Wanamet, because it was the BASAP soldiers, and they started to arm themselves, and they, they weren't receiving a salary from the state, so they started to be enforcers and, 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 and perhaps traffic different things so they could pay themselves their own salary. So you have all these competing actors. Um, I don't know if that nuance, I'll, I'll definitely go to Internationalist 360 and, and, and visit these, these articles, I'm sure to learn uh, many things. Now, in the Republic of Port-au-Prince, it was the paramilitaries who had full control. And if we look at, for example, Jimmy Cherizier barbecue, right? A, a, if you look at the different quote unquote demonstrations that he had, well, they were demonstrations within his own neighborhood. And what happens with the gang leaders or the paramilitary leaders or the, or the gang bosses, the warlords, what's the correct vocabulary, the mercenaries, the leaders of the death squads, or some say that Jimmy Cherizier has some type of uh, revolutionary potential to captivate the lumpen proletariat, though I didn't hear that uh, uh, much in Haiti uh, with the different organizations and grassroots movement like Jimmy Cherizier is the man in his fiefdom in, in, in Delma Amba in, in his neighborhood. So he would have his own protest there. But if Jimmy Cherizier were to leave his neighborhood, I mean, his head would be blown off so quick. He has so many different uh, enemies. So to say that there was some united protest movement in Port-au-Prince would be impossible, a city that 80% of which is under the thumb of these paramilitary outfits. My research was showing that 99.9% .9 of all the guns came from Florida, came from the US, uh, some Galils from Israel. You're talking about upwards towards 1 million illegal guns. That's what fuels uh, this horrific war. We're talking about tens of thousands of, of, of deaths, entire neighborhoods. Like any Haiti watchers out there will remember Cité Soleil and Solino and these different historical neighborhoods that were the bastion of, of, of Lavalas and Lavalas's resistance. Some of those neighborhoods quite simply uh, have ceased to exist largely because they've been burnt to a crisp. But things are very dynamic in some of the refugee camps, which are just tens of thousands of families taking over schools or staying in public parks and often they get attacked again. They've been burnt out of the neighborhoods. Now there's rumors and, and footage uh, appearing that these families are, are returning to Kafufe 
and, and they're being led by this or that leader. I mean, sometimes the populations don't have a choice. They're not going to say it's a gang boss or a criminal because that's the person who's in charge. And if you want to get a, a bag of food or you want to get a favor or you want to get a better spot, because there is no refugee center. There's no refugee camp. There's no people are just there's no state in Haiti. Not, not a traditional state as we would imagine. And, and that's why, too, Haiti has been used as a transshipment point by international drug traffickers. And the lunacy to think that the Kenyans are going to solve uh, something unless the Kenyans are bringing food and solidarity and, and anti-imperialist education. What are the Kenyans going to solve? Uh, a lot of the drugs come in from the south of Haiti. That's why it's so important to control the central arty, ar, 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 um, the central uh, roads of, of Haiti, because that's how the drugs would move. And that would indicate that there are hundreds of millions of dollars flowing through Haiti. And that's why the gang boss is so important as proxy powers for bigger colonial powers and the oligarchs. And these individuals, whether it's Izo in Village de Die or 400 Mawuzo in Croix de Bouquet, where Wyclef is from, I won't give any more examples because it's only going to make sense to individuals who know the political geography of Port-au-Prince. But if you control those roadways, you potentially control hundreds of millions of dollars that are flowing through there with the cocaine, with the heroin, whatever it is. And that, I think, is the partial explanation for how what's one million people guns. Because the gun in Haiti on the street value of one of these guns is ten thousand to fifteen thousand dollars, and most of the youngsters who who you see with the ski masks and the and you know in the in the AK forty seven, they haven't even ate lunch. They're hungry. They're called the gangsters with flip flops. And what the Haitian movement is saying. The Haitians with the, the gangsters with flip flops are not the enemy. It's the gangsters with ties. It's the gangsters with suits in Ottawa, in Washington, in Petionville. So I would send a more fragmented picture of what's going on. But again, things are very dynamic. And if the gangs, if the paramilitaries, I mean, Jimmy Cherizier, if we take him at his word, his organization or his confederation of nine gangs was called the Genef, and his slogan was, um, then he changed his name, Revolution Alliance of the Confederation of Nine Gangs. You touch one of us, you touch all of us, you mess with one of us, you mess with all of us. Longest game in the longest name in the history of gangs. I guess show you that much, Stephen, because that's the whole name. But that no longer exists. Now it's Vivan Sam. We live together. And, I, and I'll end with this for the next question, because I could talk about this stuff for hours. What I was doing was documenting the people's resistance on the front lines, on the barricades. Barricades reminiscent of the Spanish Civil War, reminiscent of the Soviet Union resisting the Nazis. And those barricades were 24-7. There were shootouts. You know, if I, if I went this way, they had to grab my head and say, no, we can't go down that alleyway. So these are people struggling to survive. And, 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 and it's a popular resistance. They're outgunned, but they somehow hold on. Now, overnight last week, Jimmy Cherizier announces all the different factions and gangs have united. And supposedly there's a truce now. If we listen to his press conferences, he's saying, turn your guns around. Uh, don't no longer shoot the people. Turn your guns around against the bourgeoisie. But the people are saying, well, you've been massacring us. I'm not Jimmy Cherizier in particular, necessarily. Though a lot of accounts say he was the butcher and the assassin of, of, of Belay. So my analysis is constantly changing. It's constantly challenged. I don't think anyone has it figured out. Certainly the Haitian people need all of the hope and heroes that they can get. So if Jimmy Cherizier can stop the violence against the oppressed, the oppressed on oppressed violence, and somehow lead some united effort against the entrenched colonial system in Haiti, I mean, that would be beyond amazing. Okay, so immediately now we're faced with the prospect of these supposedly 1,000 um, uh, police officers from Kenya. Um, and uh, Jemima Pierre, uh, Dr. Dr. Pierre, has um, explained to us how this is part of 
another manifestation of the United States use of uh, the Global Fragility Act to use uh, foreign powers as a kind of cat's paws or proxies to achieve their foreign policy aims. Um, and it's still not clear if or when that uh, force is likely to arrive in Haiti. Presumably, it'll lead to an even deeper crisis than the one that's uh, already underway, affecting, causing so much suffering to the Haitian people. Um, and how do you see, is there any possibility of a political solution? Or are we just going to lurch from one episode of uh, intervention and crisis to another? I mean, uh, how, how do you see things progressing? What I always hear from the Haitian people is, this is a planned and organized crisis, uh, disaster capitalism, and more chaos and crisis. They can justify boots on the ground. And, and what Dr. Uh, Jamima Pierre's research, and, and, and she did an amazing interview on Democracy Now!, amazing that she could reach millions of, of progressive people. She's saying that uh, Haitians don't want to be part of this colonial laboratory because the Global Fragility Act could then be used, as they're using it now against Haiti to justify this fourth invasion and occupation. They could say, well, you know, look at Cuba. I'm just going to I'm just going to use imperialist rhetoric for a second. Cuba is hemorrhaging refugees. It is our humanitarian responsibility to invade Cuba and, and to put in a new regime, overthrow this regime because it's a it's a refugee issue. It's a humanitarian crisis and, it, and it's affecting us. So Ron DeSantis and Trump, it's an election year and Greg Abbott. I mean, I just came from the Midwest. I'm in the Bronx now, but. The main issue, I mean, almost the religion of the uh, white working class in Trump country in the Midwest is xenophobia. It's anti-immigrant hysteria. So the Global Fragility Act would then be a preemptive measure that the U.S. could 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 try to weaponize rhetorically to say, well, we have to occupy, it's not, you know, we're just such good people with humanitarian motives. And that's how they would justify the invasions of the future, similar somehow to the humanitarian imperialism that they used against Syria, against Libya, against any country who they don't have full spectrum uh, domination uh, uh, over. The, the Haitian people reject categorically. Dr. Pierre spoke on it on a Twitter space with DD Politics on uh, Tuesday night. They reject any invasion of Haiti. And the slogan that you hear the most or the expression, say, Grand Moon Tetli, we are adults. We can determine our own destiny. We can be self determining. And imagine one of the proudest nations, the nation with the most incredible legacy of resistance and revolution. They have to say out loud in 2024 that they're adults, that they can determine their own destiny. If all the U.S. guns and the U.S. proxy powers were taken away, I mean, the Haitian masses would sort out their destiny uh, very quickly. And, mm -hmm. and and they would take revenge on, on these oligarchs, etc. Those oligarchs would be in their helicopters and private jets. They have their own ports. So if the oligarchs own the ports and the roads and they use these, you know, these, 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 um, you know, the ghetto chiefs or whatever, that's that's the war on Haiti. That's that's the hierarchy of the weapons, the drugs and the paramilitary outfits. OK, um, we're running out of time, Danny, but um, perhaps we have time for one last point. Um, uh, President Ziamara Castro uh, of Honduras. Honduras has the pro tempore presidency of the CELAC, the community of Latin American and Caribbean states. And she issued what I, I, I uh, felt was uh, a very uh, independent and dignified statement, insisting that there should be no armed intervention of any kind in Haiti and that um, the Haitian people should be. Uh, 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 encouraged and supported in um, realizing their own self-determination. And is there a snowball's chance in hell of that actually happening? <laughs> 
Well, you know, shout out to uh, Xiomara Castro de Zelaya in Selac and Alba and Mercosur and Telesur and all these true instruments of multipolarity. I would answer your uh, question, Stephen, by saying that Haiti's self-determination, like uh, Palestine or in Gaza's very survival, is intimately intertwined with the rise of this multipolar world, but we're not, we're not there yet. Clearly the BRICS plus nations economically and diplomatically, they're, they're, they're making moves, it's very exciting. But if we lived in a truly multipolar world, uh, somebody could stop US militarism and Zionism in the West Bank and in Gaza and in the Palestine of the Caribbean, in, 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 in Haiti. So in terms of this snowball's chance, I mean, there's no way right now. I mean, we're, we're still, how many years or, or, or dare I say decades away from the true uh, uh, decay, the true decline of, of, of US empire. Um, I think it's gonna take a, a lot more. I think that every move in the US press right now is aimed at making this invasion happen. So everyone should be expect all of the sensationalist headlines. Uh, Haiti became the top story in the world uh, for the second time in three years last Tuesday because of this horrific racist rumor that one of these gang bosses was uh, a cannibal. And that's consistent with the U.S. media, uh, with the white supremacist media and how they've always treated the spirituality of Haitians, voodoo. Most Americans couldn't even tell you the name of the language that Haitians speak, Creole. So hopefully this is, uh, uh, as, as, as our teacher comrades say, a teachable moment. And we can respond to all these sensationalist uh, headlines. But the Haitian people do feel uh, isolated right now, trapped between the paramilitaries and neocolonialism, and then a potential, you know, the next boots on the ground. And, and, and what happened from 2004 to 2017, those Brazilian soldiers committed massacres in Cité Soleil, in Fort Nacional, in Cité Militaire. Those Sri Lankan and Nepalese soldiers uh, brought cholera that killed tens of thousands of, of Haitians. The Uruguayan and Chilean soldiers, soldiers were involved in sexual violence and rape scandals. So no UN, no OAS, no matter how you dress it up, that's one demand that we can all uh, 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 get behind. Uh, but at the same time, where are all the guns? The guns are not in the hands of the Haitian uh, masses. So how are they going to to hang on? If this was truly a multipolar moment, perhaps we could look to history, how the Vietnamese uh, entered uh, Cambodia in 1975 uh, to stop the, the, the killing fields. Perhaps we could look at the Tanzanians were the ones to stop Idi Amin's uh, dictatorship at, at one point. Certainly there's moments of internationalism, but I don't, I don't, I don't see, like, of course, her speech, Xiomara Castro de Zalaya, her speech, and Nicolas Maduro, their speeches are so important, but do we truly have that Bolivarian military unity and momentum to decisively weigh in in defense of the 12 million people plus of Haiti? We're not there yet, but that is the Bolivarian dream, certainly. Okay, Danny, well, thank you very much for giving us so much of your time and so much of your expertise. And uh, we look forward to talking to you again, perhaps, um, as uh, the situation develops in Haiti. Thank you very much, Danny. Indubitably. Thank you, Stephen. We'll be in touch. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.